Um, there we go. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Nutter Kaufman. I'm a manager in our teacher quality department here at NEA headquarters. And we are here tonight to talk a little bit more about Google, uh, Google Classroom. And I have a mosquito in my house. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that we are recording, that the recording will be available um, will be available in the next couple of days um, at our website, www.nea.org um, slash webinars. And um, also you can receive, we can give you a certificate for continuing professional development credit hours if that's something that you want. We'll have instructions on how to do that, but we always have lots of questions about that on the front end and just wanna get those little housekeeping pieces um, done. We will definitely talk about it. So I'm going to pass it over to our executive committee member joining us, Hannah Vandering. Hannah? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you tonight to continue our learning journey together and hear from some of our amazing colleagues. So my name is Hannah Vandering. I'm an elementary physical education teacher, and I proudly serve on your NEA executive committee. And on behalf of our president, Becky Pringle, and your entire executive committee team, I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar. We begin each of our NEA meetings by acknowledging that we meet no matter where we are in this country on the traditional land served by Native peoples. We honor America's first people and all elders, past, present, and emerging. And we are called upon to learn and share what we learn about the tribal history, culture, and contributions that have been suppressed in telling the story of America. And for me, I'm in Oregon. I reside on Kalapuyan land. The Kalapuya people have occupied this land for over 14,000 years. For centuries, they had a seasonal way of life where they successfully harvested vegetables, hunted wildlife, and fished throughout the valley. Beginning in about 1790, they began suffering from the plagues of the newcomer explorers and fur traders to the region. Malaria took hold in 1829 and within five years had decimated some 90% of the population. By 1850, their populations declined from over 20,000 to about 1,000. Due to the pressures of American settlement, they signed treaties with the United States government. In these treaties, they ceded away over 1 million acres and were removed to the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation. A century later, the Grand Ronde Indian Reservations were terminated by the United States. During the termination period, their languages went extinct, but the Kalapuyan people continued to follow their traditions. Elders began working on restoration of the Grand Ronde tribes in the 1970s. And today, Kalapuyan descendants are important historical figures in the restoration of the tribe and are partnering with the Oregon Department of Education to improve education in Oregon. This is the story of Oregon. I wanna thank you for lifting up the story in your area. And I wanna to share tonight two words that I know you do not hear enough, and that is thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for all that you're doing during these unprecedented times. To say that the workload and stress have increased during distance learning is a gross understatement. In talking with my colleagues, the workload and stress are unbelievable and unbearable. And yet you continue to work harder to, every day to make a difference in the lives of your students. So tonight, we hope to provide some relief and some support and some good fellowship together with our colleagues. Uh, we are committed, and tonight's work is evident of that, to member-created and member-led work. And we also know that we don't have all of the answers, but our mission of uniting our members in the nation to fulfill the promise of public education demands that we share and move forward best practices. And these webinars are a way to do just that. So this evening, we have two incredible member, members from Michigan who are going to share with us. Heather Hoopa and Carmen Nordstrom are going to be sharing their expertise in helping us explore new and exciting ways to use Google Classroom. And this webinar, so you know, was scheduled after feedback from a prior webinar. So tonight at the end, we're gonna ask you for your feedback and we're gonna ask you for other topics that you might be interested in. So please fill out that evaluation. And finally, just to be clear, we're not endorsing any particular product or platform, but you're, what you're here tonight is what members are using and the experience they have in the online space. 
So our goal is to provide you with as many tools and supports as possible. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to the stars of tonight's show, Heather and Karma. Thank you so much. Take it away. All right. Um, hi, Hannah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and you got my last name right, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Awesome. Um, Karma, do you want me to go over these webinar procedures? Yeah, sure. I'm just going to put them all up here. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's great. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, awesome. So just remember that due to the large number of participants attending this webinar, your camera and microphone will be muted. So if you do have any loud dis distracting noises in the background, you're fine. We can't hear them. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, we have some people helping us out with that tonight. And so it's just helpful for them to go into the Q&A box. We can always come back to them, answer them during the webinar or answer them right in that Q&A box. Um, use the chat feature if you wanna say something's awesome or if you love it, or if there's a way you recommend using something we talk about, definitely uh, put that in the chat. We love hearing your ideas. We also love just having the community knowledge. It helps us to learn from you um, while you're learning from us. Um, so if you could try to ask questions concisely, sometimes it um, is challenging to go back and forth um, with what you're trying to say. So if you could just be very specific so we could try to answer that. We will try to answer as many questions as we can after the webinar. Um, and we will also respond to your questions throughout the presentation. So we'll be here for a little bit afterwards for some Q&A if you'd like to do that. Or if you want to uh, ask a specific question as we're going, definitely use the Q&A box for that. All right. Oops. Oh, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening to me in class today. <laughs> I can't get this right. Um, all right. So hi, everyone. I'm Heather Hoopa. I am a seventh grade social studies teacher um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I have been teaching. This is my fifth year. Um, this is the most unique year of them all with teaching completely virtual. It has been a very fun, interesting also a rewarding experience, but I do miss my students a lot. Uh, I have used Google Classroom with both upper and lower and elementary uh, using, using it to implement some blended learning into my classroom. And I'm really excited to share with you just some of our knowledge so that we can help you during this really interesting time of COVID, but even to give you some tools for once you're back in the classroom full time and things go back to normal, uh, you have a lot of these tools to help you with differentiating for all of your students. And hi, I'm Karma Nordstrom, and I teach seventh and eighth grade social studies in Ann Arbor. Um, this is my 13th year of teaching. I have taught um, grades from um, like fifth grade up through high school, and uh, I've used Google Classroom uh, for about four years, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And I just going back and preparing for this webinar after we've been we've switched at our school to Schoology. Um, where I kind of feel like I had to start all over again as a beginner and learn everything new. Um, I'm really kind of missing Google Classroom because it, after all these years, I had gotten really good at it. But I'm so excited that you are here to learn about it because I think it's a fantastic tool and I'm really excited about teaching you about this. Okay, Heather. All right, so here's our agenda. Um... So we do end up hopping out of this slideshow a little bit, but if you do come back to reference this, hopefully uh, these little icons and everything will help you to know which part of the slideshow we're at. So right now we're gonna do a pre-PD check-in. Um, and just because I know we won't be coming back to this too much, we will also be doing a Google Classroom vocabulary. We'll discuss providing thoughtful feedback, differentiating assignments, featured apps, and then at the end, we'll do some questions. All right, so our first thing is a check-in. So let's see how everyone's feeling right now. Um, this is one of my favorite check-ins, it's a color chart. And so you're just gonna find the color that matches how you're feeling right now. So um, if you're feeling high energy and super pleasant, you're gonna be a yellow. If you're feeling high energy, but maybe a little bit unpleasant, you might be a red. If you're pleasant with low energy, that grayish color. Um, and then unpleasant with low energy, you'll be a green. So. We just want to see where everyone's at. I'm seeing a lot of reds, yellows. I like somebody shared and they said yeller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, green. We have some greens. Hey, at least we're honest. Um, the gray. Yeah. Okay. I know. I'm kind of like gray. I'm super stoked to be here, but uh, it's definitely a Monday. I'm feeling drained. <laughs> I'm going to make it to Friday. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. We got a real mix of colors today, but we You're understand uh, these are, these are challenging times right now. Believe <laughs> you. We know. <laughs> Honestly, you might go through all of these colors in one day and that's, totally <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> that's for real. Um, all right, perfect. And the next one is on a scale of zero to five. So, and this is a judgment free zone. I want you to know. So zero could be, you absolutely hate using online tools for teaching and learning. You're all about that old fashioned paper and pencil, and you don't yeah. mind keeping it that way. Five is that you absolutely enjoy learning about new, new tools, digital tools for your classroom. And you would love for everything to just be all digital. The, the first two numbers, it went from a six to a zero. So that kind of <laughs> says it. Okay. Oh, and I just saw a 10 go by. So we've got a real um, range of moods and um, feelings about technology today. I do want to say, of course, we admire all of you for being here and we appreciate your time and just the energy you put into your classrooms and your students. But those of you that are at that zero or the one, like that's like a big like kudos round of applause to you for being here, getting through it, challenging yourselves, taking on that challenge and really pushing yourself to, to be the best you that you can be for your students through uh, this very unique and challenging time. All right, so just so you know, the format of this class will be a live tutorial. So right now we are using a slide deck to present some information to you. But in a few minutes here, Karma's gonna actually hop out of this slide deck and start doing live demonstrations of things you can do in Google Classroom to show you how to navigate and access some really cool features. So while she's demoing, you're just gonna pick something that feels best for you and how you are as a learner. So maybe you strictly just wanna watch what we're doing and that's fine. That's totally okay. Um, Chris has actually put in the chat links to the slideshow, so you can still save it for later if you want. Or if you want to watch and take notes at the same time, or watch and like split your screen, watch on one side and follow along on the slide deck on another, that's completely up to you. But we are going to be leaving the slide deck soon. Yeah, and just, you know, the slide deck is definitely a resource that you're going to mm -hmm. want to look back on later um, if if you want to review things, because I, I made a bunch of videos on there and there's a bunch of resources. So don't lose that slide deck. I think yeah. you'll appreciate it. <laughs> there is lots of great links in there and lots of great videos by Karma. Um, so now are some important symbols and vocab. So a lot of what we have on the left column is probably what you're pretty familiar with. So the first one is the waffle, which is the Google Apps menu. The next one is a hamburger, which is another menu that you see. <clears throat> we have the settings gear, my personal favorite, the snowman. Um, and sometimes you see it um, vertical like that, and sometimes it is horizontal, but the snowman gives you more options. The add people sign with a person and a plus sign. The reuse kind of reminds me of the reuse, reduce, recycle sign. Um, this little kind of like squiggly line here is to go to your grade book. We have a little, we have a little dialogue one with the plus sign that's to add a comment. Another little conversation bubble with a bookmark that's your comment bank. Another little bubble here with three lines in it is your comment history. And then we have this gray one here and that is for grades. So I know this is a lot to digest right now, but Karma will go through it and it will all make sense. I just um, have to mention that Karen called that sideways snowman the melting snowman. That laugh. <laughs> That's a, we'll have to add that. <laughs> right. That's great. That's really great. Um, so Karma and I, we have practiced with Google Classroom a lot. And one thing that we always recommend to everyone we talk to is making a sandbox for practice, right? It's like your playground to do whatever you want, where no one else can see in case you whoopsie or in case you just post a lot of things throughout the day, but it's just a really good way to be able to learn and explore Google Classroom without having any students in your class. So we always encourage having like some other trusted colleague, maybe your teammate, your teaching partner, maybe some support staff member being a student of your classroom and then vice versa where they can create a classroom and then you're the student. Because unfortunately in Google Classroom, there's not a view as student mode. And so that's truly the only way you can do it. But what's really nice is that you can also use your sandbox to keep all of your stuff there and organize. And we'll talk about that a little bit with rubrics today that you can create sandboxes specifically for certain items so that whenever you need them, you can always pull them from your sandbox. 
Okay. Um, and if you're lucky enough, you have a son and an exchange student who are in your school district. So you're going to see their names um, because they are part of our sandbox <laughs> or mine. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use this opportunity to jump out of this slideshow now and jump over to Google Classroom. And the first thing I think I'll show you is what we saw on this slide. And this is about how we can get to quickly get to the grade book. And that's what I'm gonna talk about first. So this is the slideshow that we're going to look at, but I'm gonna jump back using this hamburger menu to the Google Classroom. Oops, I, I wanna go back here to my classes page. And if I wanna jump out of, I'll just jump right to my grade book from this uh, main menu, this little squiggly line will take me right there and I can jump there and all of a sudden I am at my grade book. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we set up the grade book and how we set up the grades. So I'm going to go back to the main page. This is the stream. And I'm going to go up here to the gear icon up in the upper right hand corner. And hopefully you're familiar with some of these other parts of the settings. We usually go over this in our beginning course, but we always wait on the grading until we get to advanced. So this is the grading section here. And I just wanna get rid of any categories here. So what we have here are the grading and we have a way of setting up our grades to calculate total points weighted by category, or no overall grade. So no overall grade is what it's usually set for automatically. And when we were teaching in the spring, we weren't grading anything. But now that we're back to grading, it's time to start thinking about how things should be scored in Google Classroom. So I'm first gonna show you the total points. So if I click on this, then I need to set up grade categories. Um, I can decide if I wanna show those grades to students or not. I'm gonna click yes, I want those grades to be shown to students. And now I'm going to add some grade categories and determine how many points they should have. So it automatically sets it up as 10, but one thing you could do, let's say you might have tests, maybe you have those for 50 points, you could set, add another one, you could say quizzes. Um, are 20 points and you could say um, um, 30 points for homework. Okay, I'm just making that up. Okay, so that's one way that you could set it up for points. And when you look in the grade book, I'm gonna save, oh, I'm not sure if it's gonna show up there. Um, anyway, but it will show up when we select these categories, when we set up uh, assignments it will automatically, if we choose tests, it will automatically set it to 50 points. If we've set the assignment as a category of a quiz, it'll be 20 points homework. Now we could also do weighted by category. So if we click this, then it gives us a percentage. So um, last time I based it on 100, so I could do kind of the same thing, 50, um, 20, and 30. Now it has to add up to 100%. Now, the way I generally do it at our school is um, we, I just have two kinds of assignments generally. And I set my categories up as I have, oops, I'm gonna put it back to points. I always do everything on a four point scale and I have formative assignments and I have summative assignments and they're always four points. And then when I put them into my grade book in PowerSchool, my summative assignments will go in as a letter grade and these will stay as a number grade, but I, every, the kids are used to using a four point schedule. So that's our four point rubric. So that's what I'm going to use for my setup today. All right, so now we're going to, I'm gonna show you how to set up a rubric and use those categories that we set up as well. So I've gone under the classwork tab and I have an assignment here 
that I'm going to use to make a rubric. So I've already kind of started the assignment, but I want to add some information to it. So I'm going to click on the snowman and I'm going to click edit. And as you see, I've already added the title. I've added some instructions here and now I can set the category. So let's say this is a, I'm going to say this is a summative assignment. So it will count towards the student's grade. It's going to keep that four points because that's what I put there. Um, and now though, I want to add a rubric to go with my four points. So to create a rubric, I'm gonna click on this button here that says plus rubric. And I have three choices, create a rubric, reuse a rubric and import from sheets. And I'm just going to create a rubric right now by clicking, sorry, click create rubric. And now I can give it a title, my criterion, a title, a description, and then I can add my points. So I'm just gonna do a simple four point rubric to start with. And I like to do mine from highest to lowest. So I'm going to change this to a four. My four is always got it. And I might say something like you mastered the target. Now, if I wanna add another point level here, I'm gonna push, click this little plus sign and I'm gonna set this at three. And my three is always almost there. All right, and then I'm going to do with my two, which is Oops, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, moving in the right direction. And my one is just getting started. Um, I'm, I'm just writing some very simple descriptions. No, you're fine. <laughs> I'm just going to interrupt and talk. So yeah. this rubric is whatever. So in Karma's situation with her grading scale, it's always four points. So if you want to just do a one point, like if you're doing one point for turn in or no points, or it's really whatever you want it to be. Sometimes I've gone in and made these like five. So it'll be like a five, 10, 15, 20. Um, you could, and you don't even have to have five or four point values in there. So it's really up to you on what you want to make it. Um, it allows for a lot of like, just a lot of room for whatever you want it to be. I think a lot about some of my writing rubrics I used to have as an elementary teacher that would have a ton of different categories. And so um, it's really up to you to customize however you want. Yeah, really, if, if I wanted to, let's say, um, like if I wanted several criteria I could come up here and I could just um, duplicate. So if I wanted to have many levels, I could duplicate this. And then I could give each level, each one of these levels, a different title, and um, or I could just add another one by hitting the plus button here and start a whole new one. So it's it's really a nice, it's really a very easy tool for making rubrics. And once you have your rubrics built, then you can copy them and share them. They're very helpful. Oh, I'm just looking at some of the notes in the chat. Very interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one that I, uh, I'm just gonna get rid of this. Show you one that I created already. Let's see here. So just so you can see one that I made. So this is already set up in this assignment. If I click here to edit, I can click on this rubric right here. This is the rubric that I have created for this assignment. And you can see that I have a much more complicated rubric. So this was for a writing assignment. It was for a letter that the students had to write. So I have my salutation and closing, my introductory paragraph, my claim, evidence, reasoning. So there's many levels to this. And you can see how here I had four four different levels, but on the conventions, like the spelling and grammar, I just kind of had it like you either got it or you don't. So I just made a four and a one. So you have a lot of options with these and it's, it's really nice. Uh, it's a nice tool. 
So I want to show you how you can reuse a rubric. So I'm going to go back up to this assignment where I was adding a rubric. And if I go back under this rubric button and I click reuse rubric, now I have access, I can look at all the different classes that I have had before. So if I look here, uh, if I click on this little carrot up at the top, this will show me all my classes. So I can look into all my different classes and find if I remember a rubric that I used that I really liked, um, I could use one of those. So let me see if I can find one. I'm just gonna look into an old class. Nope, no rubrics. Let's go back into the same class that we're in. That's this one. Okay. So you can see I have a lot of different rubrics that are listed in here. So maybe I want to choose this quick writing response. I'll select that and then I can open that up. I'm and so, I'm, I'm sorry. So glad you pulled this one up because it has the emojis, which I was just about to talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. You read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so here's one, yeah, that Heather created. And I don't have to use this exactly it was created. I could go through and fix this. For one thing, like this little emoji didn't show up right here. So um, if I want to edit this rubric, I can click edit. And oh, my little emoji didn't turn out well. I can <laughs> go in. He was the super happy guy. <laughs> yeah, see if I can find that super happy. I'm just gonna take that guy. All right, Let's see if it copied on there. Okay, so now we have a new emoji. So emojis are another thing you can use for these or um, thumbs up, you know, all the, there's all kinds of little um, tools you can use. I really like this Joy Pixels. It's a emoji keyboard and it has a lot of different icons and you can even get different skin colors. Here's like a nice thumbs up that I could put in there in place of my smiley face if I wanted to. So there are a lot of different things we can do like that with rubrics. Thank you for uh, reminding me about the emojis. Yeah, I was just thinking of our lower L friends who were like, oh gosh, <laughs> we need something too. So uh, yeah, you can definitely use pictures and emojis, anything to make it. Um, I, I have students even in middle school who really benefit from those kind of tools. So then I can just save. And now I have that rubric as part of my assignment. Uh, and I want to show you one more thing that you can do, or one more thing that is in here, but it's a little misleading. <laughs> so if we click on the rubric button, there is also this import from sheets. And this would make you think that you could import a, a rubric that you have created in sheets um, that looks really nice. Sheets is like an Excel program and you've got them all in columns and it looks really nice. And you think, why can't I just transfer this over to Google Classroom? Well, it doesn't work the way it, that's supposed to work. If you try to import a Google, I just tried it again today to see if they fixed this and they haven't. So um, it, just, it just doesn't work right. It's really meant for teachers to be sharing. Um, if you want to export your rubric, then like email it to another teacher so she can import it into her classroom, then it will be in a specific format that will work for Google Classroom. But it has to be in this very specific format. I did put something in the, the slideshow that is a template if you really would like to create your rubrics and sheets, but I think you will find that creating your rubrics in Google Classroom is a lot easier than using this um, kind of convoluted uh, template. Okay, did I cover everything that we need with rubrics? Yeah, Heather? you're doing good. And then just a heads up, we're at the 730 mark. So I just wanna- Okay, wanna... thank you. Yeah, we, we had a much longer session last time. So I wanna make sure yeah. we don't run out of time. <laughs> we're consolidating our- Yeah. Okay, so the next thing I wanna show you is um, assignments and giving thoughtful feedback. So here I have, and I've used my son and my exchange student who are both in my district. And so we're going to see some stuff that they have done. We're going to look at this assignment. It was a writing assignment. And I'm going to click on my students. 
who have turned their work in, which just happens to be my son. And um, I'm going to give him some feedback. Let me make sure I have a rubric set up for this assignment. Hold on a second. Okay, I do have a rubric set up. So I just wanted to make sure before I went and did my grading on here. Student work, gonna open up his document and I'm gonna show you a little bit about how to give thoughtful feedback on a writing assignment using Google Classroom. And this is one of the things I miss so much about using Google Classroom that we don't have right now in uh, Schoology when we use uh, Google Assignments. And if somebody knows a way to do that, they need to tell me after this class. Um, so there are several ways, modes that you have for um, commenting on students' work. So when you first come into the document, it will be in, is it this key? Yep. We start off in suggesting mode. So it's automatically in suggesting mode when we get into the document. And what suggesting mode does is if, we find a mistake. Let's say I see that Mexico and city, they should both be capitalized, not just Mexico. And I want to suggest a change. So I'm highlighting cities. Actually, what I'm going to do is highlight, I'm just going to make the change right on here. I'm going to delete that C and put in a capital C. And you see, it doesn't just exactly change the document. It shows what the change should be and it makes a little note on the side. And now I could say, you know, always capitalize um, proper nouns. Okay, I can add a little comment there. And then when they, when the student comes in, they can choose, do they want to accept that change and click the check or they can refuse that change, but they have to make that decision and I'm not just going in there and changing it for them. So that's a really good way to make a suggestion, you know, for changes without kind of doing all the work for the students and being able to add that little comment really helps. Now, another thing, um, editing is where I could just edit right in the document. I could just go in here and just change the spelling of the word. And um, the student would get no notification, nothing. I've just gone in and fixed it unless I add a comment to that. So I don't really like using that tool. Um, I can also, um, there's also a viewing option but this isn't as useful when you are trying to make comments on the student's work. So I would really re recommend to stay in that suggesting mode or the editing mode, depending on how you're giving your commentary. Now, another thing I can do here is add comments. Um, so if I highlight this word and I want to tell the student that there's a spelling error here, I can, when I have highlighted that word over here in the right column, there is a little comments button. That's one way I can do it. There's the same comments tab is up here in my toolbar. And I can also, if I show my whole, um, I can also go up here into insert and insert a comment this way. But really the easiest way is just to click over here in the margin and then I can make a comment. And I could say um, spelling error. All right, and I can click a comment. Now, the nice thing about comments in Google Classroom is you can have a comment bank of some comments that you make quite frequently. And if I click on this little, um, this is sort of like a little comment with a bookmark in it. If I click here, I can, my screen is a little too tight here. Sorry, I have a million things on my desktop. Okay, so you can see I have some things in my comment bank already. So remember to capitalize proper nouns, always capitalize the first word in a sentence. So here where I had distribution, maybe instead of doing spelling error, Actually, I'm not gonna, instead of this um, Mexico City, I'm gonna delete that. Come on. All right. 
I could have highlighted Mexico City and then I click on my comments. And what I can do is put in the hashtag symbol and that will call up my comment bank and I can choose from my comment bank that way. Karma, it's Anne. Yeah. It's actually a request for you to enlarge your screen. Oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. I've been having trouble sort of, let me close that. I don't want to get it too big so where we can't see anything, but okay, I understand my students have this problem all day, especially if they're on Chromebooks and you know they have a hard time seeing on a small screen. All right, so what I did is I put in a hashtag in the comments that called up my comment bank. Another thing I could have done if I just start typing those words. If I know what it is, oftentimes the suggestion will come up of something that was in my comment bank and I can choose that. I could also highlight the word and then go over to my comment bank. None of these really fit. So maybe I wanna add something new. So I could say, type in here, um, Okay, maybe I would try to be a little kinder instead of just being so matter of fact, but uh, I'm gonna add that to my comment bank. And now I can choose that for my comment. I can copy this to the clipboard. And then when I make a comment, I can paste that in if I want to do it that way. And then something that we found out that was really cool about making comments is let's say um, down here, you really like this concluding paragraph. And so I want to make a comment. I make a comment, let's say I wanna bold something. If I wanna bold a word in my comments, I put an asterisk on each side of the word that I want to bold. And if I click comment, you see that that word is bolded. So that was kind of a cool thing that I recently learned about this. Doing all these webinars, you actually learn a lot of things from the participants. <laughs> all right, so I am going to close up my comment bank. Can I just, sorry. Yeah. Really, so one, um, just because this was asked in the um, Q&A. Sure. Um, so you're, you don't have to recreate a comment bank at all like once you have your comments in your comment bank it essentially just saves to what would be your account and so it moves with you um so you don't have to recreate it every time there's an assignment they all stick there so that you can keep reusing them um and again to make those comments all you have to do is either open up the comment bank and you can add comments right through there or like karma showed when you have a comment that you frequently use a lot there will be an option in the snowman to add it to the comment bank Thank you, Heather. Yeah, thank you, sorry. <laughs> All right, and so now the now that I have this my rubric set up already in here, I want you to see that the rubric is over here on the right side. So I can use that rubric to grade this assignment and each category of my rubric is here. If I want to look at it more carefully, I can click this carrot and kind of review what the different care, um, categories are for each one of these, to kind of see the different levels. I can either type a number in this number box or I can just click these. So if I know that this is one, or I'm sorry, if this is four, <laughs> gotta remember which order I do it in. Um, and I remember this is one, um, I can go through and click those and it will um, add them to the grade. And so now I've put all my grades in and you can see here it adds up, there were 28 total points, but I set this, I'm probably with my screen today. Oh, I know what it is. I didn't set my points for the assignment. So it is um, showing this total points, but since I didn't set it for four, it's not quite what I want it to do. So, um, I'm gonna go back to my assignment. 
See, I forgot to set it up as a category. So I'm going to set it up as summative and it's four points. Let's see if it will change it over in my assignment where I'm grading. All right, I just, yep, my grades are here and now it's out of four. And I have, can add a little private comment here. And if I have the private comments, I can post those comments. Those will go directly to the students, but the grades will not go directly to the students until I return this assignment. And I'm not sure why my rubric isn't attaching, isn't showing my grades. No. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I can't figure out why it's not showing. It might just be because I changed it after the fact. I'm not sure. But usually oh, what it will do is it will take this and calculate it and show this in the grade uh, section of what it would be out of four depending on how I graded it down below. But I did something wrong. Let's try to return it and see what. Okay, I'm going to return it to the students. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what is, it should have been turned in, it was turned in. So what can you do if a student has submitted an incomplete assignment? You can go in and you can still grade and, and return a incomplete assignment. I'm not quite sure what went wrong with this and I apologize for that. But my other student here, I'm sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong things here. It's been a while. Okay, my other student, he did not turn his work in. Okay, so this is not submitted, but I can still get into this other student's work. I can still grade it and I can, um, I, I guess I can't return it because the student hasn't actually turned it into me, but I can go through here and I can grade it um, and make comments on it and the student can still see that information. All right, I wanna make sure I get to the next thing. Okay, oh, one thing that I didn't add is that you can add different kinds. When you're doing the comments, you can um, do text comments. This is where you can also add emojis so if you wanted to put a little smiley face in there, you can certainly do that into your comments. Um, you could also even add voice comments. And I found this tool, it's called um, Read and Write, Read and Write for Google Chrome. And you open that up and you can actually record a little, um, a little voice comment, and then that will put it into the comment uh, place there. So if I click on this little record voice note, I can say, uh, very good work on your project. I can insert that and it will insert a voice comment onto the page. So that was a cool Google extension that I found. And now you can see it made it into a little voice comment that the student I can, can uh, very good work on your project. All right. So just thought I'd show you that because that was something I recently found. Um, so just one strategy, just because there's conversations in the so yeah, well, yeah, I'm out of that right now. I know, Robert, you said that you don't see um, the snowman. I'm going to try to recreate the issue you're having to help you through that. But um, so some people have said, like, what do you do if your student has submitted an incomplete assignment? So you can always grade it as is and then return it back to the student with either a partial grade. Um, you can return it back to them and say it's just not complete. Um, 
you can grade assignments if they haven't been submitted. Um, but I'm going to be honest with you. I usually um, lie to my students and say that I can't grade it unless it's submitted because I notice this trend where they just won't submit it and then I have to hunt for it <laughs> and see if it's done or not. Um, so that's just a suggestion I would make is don't don't let your students know too much that you can grade it without it being submitted because they uh, then will just keep not pressing the turn in button because sometimes they just forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that is important that you tr sort of train them to do things a certain way. Otherwise, they will get kind of lazy and sloppy and try to get away with not following through on those procedures. So I, I yeah, absolutely. But, you know, when you have to do that, you have to do that. And yeah, that Q&A. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, that's something different. Somebody's asking something different than I thought. Um, Oh, somebody's saying that they use that read and write. That's good. I love that. Okay, I want to show you really quickly because we're running short on time how to make a self grading quiz because this is something that I used quite a bit when I was using Google Classroom and have used sometimes this year, although I'm not making as much of my own curriculum this year. Um, I'm going to make a new assignment. I'm going to come up here, create, make a new assignment and just show you how to make a self grading quiz. And it would help if I could spell. All right, so when I am in the create button, I'm going to create here and create, oh, what am I doing wrong? I'm losing my mind. <laughs> oh, I know what I did wrong, sorry. I'm gonna go up here to create and then create a quiz assignment. I'm sorry, it's been a while since I've done this. <laughs> I still can't spell constitution. All right, so when I make create a quiz, it's going to automatically generate a blank Google quiz. And so what I have to do is set up the quiz with the questions. And I do this through Google Classroom. And this makes it very easy for this, this to grade itself. And then it will put the grades right into my Google Classroom if I set it to do so. Okay, let's say I'm making a constitution quiz and I have to put the name in both places. And then I can put my questions here and I will show you a, uh, one that I've created already in a moment. But what I would do is say like, who was the first president? And I could put my choices here. All right, and so there's my questions. I make this required. And the way I make it self-grading is I have to put the answer in there. So I choose the answer. And then the best part about Google quizzes is you can put this feedback in there. So I can go under here into answer feedback. If it's correct, I can just say something like great job. But for incorrect answers, I can say good try. And then I can add some extra information here. I could add a link to some text. I could add a video, um, all kinds of information so that this student could learn what they got wrong. And I wanna just jump to one that I've already created just to save time. But be aware up in this gear icon is where you can set some settings that are important for the quiz. So there's general, if you wanted to collect email addresses, if you don't wanna to have to put the students' names, you know, have to collect their name and last name, first name, um, you can just collect their email addresses automatically. Um, you can limit it to run one response or you can let them um, edit. Uh, you can let them do it more than once. Um, let's say just something for practice. You can let them edit after they submit. Um, and then if you jump over here to quizzes, uh, this is this locked mode is only going to work if your students are all using Chromebooks and I haven't heard good things about this working very um, consistently. Um, but I know that all your students have to be on Chromebooks in order for this locked mode to work. I have not ever used it because it, I've never been in that situation where all my students have Chromebooks and I know it's going to be working reliably for me. 
Um, you can have it so the grade is released immediately after each submission, and then you can set it so that they can see um, how they did. So I like to set that in those ways. So let me show you one I've already created just for time's sake. Uh, I have created a self grading quiz. Here's the president's one that I created. And on this quiz, I ask for their name and their class section. And then I have some um, different choices here. Let me show you in, in editing mode so I can show you what I did with this. So it says, who is our first president? If I click on this and I look at my answer key, you can see that I set it up. If they got it correct, it says correct. George Washington was our first president. If they are incorrect, I ask them to watch this short video so they can learn what they missed. And that will pop up as they are taking the quiz. Um, another one here in my answer key, I put a link here so they can click on this link and it will bring them to some information about John Adams to read. So this is a great tool. Um, it works so well for distance learning and especially in those cases where you're not able to give fast feedback to the students. Let's say you've just got a lot of work piled up um, and this will give them that immediate feedback. I think that this is really great for review, um, especially if you let them just take it over and over until they do really well. It's a really cool tool. Um, okay, so uh, that is most of what I was going to show you with that. Heather, can you think of anything that I'm leaving out? I'm kind of rushing, so I feel like... No, no, you're doing an awesome job. No. Okay. You're really good. You're doing great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to my slideshow. Uh, oh, I know why, because... Um, just be aware there are videos and all kinds of tools on this slideshow. So this is the one that we've given you in the chat. Um, so please feel free to look back on this. Um, there's a video, great video here on how you can use Google Classroom to differentiate assignments. Um, I do want to be able to tell you a little bit about these excellent tools that work really well with Google Classroom. Um, so one and all of these links here if you link on these, um, the links below, if you link on the icons, it will take you to the actual site. So you can see what the site looks like. And below these are little how-to videos for how to use these different tools. Uh, I'll tell you about a couple of these. Um, Edpuzzle is one that is amazing. It is a, uh, you can use YouTube videos or other videos that you've gathered and add questions to the videos and the kids, as they're watching the video, it will stop and ask them questions. So they have to answer these sort of comprehension questions or different kind of questions that you might ask about the video. If you don't wanna ask questions, you can add your own comments to it. You can add voice comments, you can add text comments. Um, so you're, you're kind of interacting with them as they are watching the movie. They're just not just sort of watching it by themselves. They have to stop and reflect and think about it as they watch. It's such a cool tool. It works perfectly or mostly perfectly. I don't know. It works very, very well with Google Classroom. They are connected. They work together. Um, so I highly recommend Edpuzzle if you get a chance to look at that. Um, another tool I really like is Kami. Kami is really good. Um, it, it's a way that you can, uh, you and students can edit PDF files. So it's great for annotating, um, for students to annotate as they read a PDF or a teacher could do that as they're reading with the student, the teacher could write or draw things, show them how to annotate using Kami. Um, and it also has features where if you give them a read aloud, they can, um, or you give them something to read that it will read it to them um, what the text is saying. So it's it's really cool. And that is also works really well with Google Classroom. Uh, but I do believe um, that one is one that your district has to pay for in order to be sort of integrated with Google Classroom, but I'm not sure about that. 
but we have that in our district. So I, I really think it's great. And then Heather, do you want to talk quickly about some of these other things before we go? Um, yeah, so I am just responding to some, some friends in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so did you get a moment to talk about Padlet? I didn't talk about Padlet, Answer Garden, or Flipgrid. Okay, yeah, so Padlet is personally like one of my favorite things to use. Um, I've used it with second, fourth, fifth, and seventh grade, and it's just a really cool, think of it as like an online like bulletin board for like post-it notes so you could ask a question and then they can go back and respond and post on it and I just think it's a really good way for students to be able to interact with each other um they can do it anonymously so if they're a little bit hesitant about sharing their answers um there is that option that you can enable but I just really like this feature I used to use it um in the spring when we were doing virtual as just like a daily check-in with my students I would just say you know just write to me like one goal for the day or write to me where you're at with your uh, book report. And so it, it can just be used in a variety of ways. And so I love that. Sometimes we use it during our webinars as just a way to check in with everyone as well. Um, and then, so Flipgrid is really cool because it's a place where you can do um, up to, I believe it's a minute and a half long video responses. My students love it. Like they are a little bit camera shy, but they can show, they can, they can put like emojis over their face or have these filters or um, just these really cool things. But it's a really cool way right now, since we're in this like virtual teaching and learning world, they don't necessarily get a lot of that social interaction. And so what I like about Flipgrid is that a little bit of their personality gets to shine through. Even if they decide to put an emoji over their face, you still get to hear their voice, get to learn a little bit about them as they're responding to a prompt. So one I did this week is just like, what's your favorite place? And so I just think it's a really good way to get, get to know your students. Um, yeah, and I just want to jump in and say yeah, that yeah. our my school used Flipgrid, our wonderful choir teacher, she made our whole talent show at the end of the year with Flipgrid. And so the kids shared Flipgrid videos of themselves doing their talents. And then we had like a watching party and it was amazing. Um, there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. Yeah, no, it's really, it's so awesome. I love it. Um, and then Answer Garden is, think of it as like a word cloud. So you can have some sort of prompt. It's a really good way to check in with students I'll towards the end of a lesson. like. And just thinking about when I get through a lesson, um, I, last week we talked about terracotta warriors in China. And so I could just say, you know, when you hear terracotta warriors, what's one thing you think of? And they can go in and respond um, and all their answers pop up. And so I just think this is a really cool way and you can save it. So it's also just a really good way to wrap up a lesson, but then to also start another lesson and be like, remember last time when we talked about terracotta warriors and here's all the things we thought of let's connect back to that today with our next lesson and so, yeah and I like how the the words that are post put in more often yeah. will come up larger just like yeah. any word cloud like that yeah so that's really awesome so yeah those are all really great tools they work really well with google classroom just a nice way to like spice it up a little bit yeah absolutely so um just be aware that we put in a lot of like little tips and tricks uh, links in here that you are welcome to explore. Um, these are some things that we've, a few of these I just added after our last session because I learned some people, some, some things from people in the chat. Um, this building a branching scenario in Google Forms, for example, um, is really cool. So uh, take a look at these tools. Um, and then at the very end here are some additional resources as well. So we've tried to add as many things as we could here so that you can go back and explore this Google Slides um, document. And then of course, if you have any questions, our information is here for how to reach us. So if, if afterwards, if you have anything you want to ask us about any of these Google Classroom tools, please do touch base. Thank you so much, Karma and Heather. We really appreciate it. Um, we, a couple of housekeeping things, and then I'm going to pass it over to Hannah for our closing uh, remarks. Um, first, um, folks were asking, will we have this recording? Will we have this? Will we have that? 
it'll be on the website in the next couple of days. Please give us at least a couple of days. Um, it's again, www.nea.org slash webinars. The recording will be there as well as directions to how to download a certificate. So you can go there and find the directions. You will have to log into our learning management system to access that certificate, but you can do that so that you can turn it in. Um, also just want to uh, preview, we do have a Schoology webinar oh, next week. Okay. And then we have um, a social emotional learning in November online, social emotional learning online and assessment online in December. So we're gonna to move to once a month because every other week I think is a lot for all of us. But I will pass it to Hannah to close us out. All right, well, thank you for that. And we have over 200 participants. Would you please light up the chat and show some NEA love to our, uh, our presenters tonight, Heather and Karma, who did an amazing job of sharing some of their expertise. And um, just to lift up a couple of things, that I learned tonight. Well, I learned a lot tonight. I haven't used this platform. So um, I just love the fact that we we're talking about helping each other and creating a rubric sandbox. I love sandboxes. So that's great. <laughs> um, talking about how to encourage students to own their own learning and using comments um, versus editing. I love the comment bank. Um, and mainly, I really appreciate the question and answer and how our team was able to provide further information because we know we learn uh, most from each other and how we support each other in our work. The comments in the, in the chat, I think, pulls it together. This is all great from basic to advanced in one session, a perfect pace. So our presenters, thank you once again. Please don't forget to fill out the evaluation it does help us to improve moving forward and understand how we can support you the most. And lastly, I'll finish as I began. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for all you do every day. Um, and thank you for your dedication to our students, our members in public education. Wish you all the best. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. I, um... After, please feel free to go ahead and log off. We'll stay on for a little while to answer some questions. I saw in the chat, people missed part of what I said. So, um, which happens, we all know we have to say things multiple times. Um, the address is www.nea.org slash webinars. And there will be the directions for how to obtain a certificate. You do not have to fill out the exit ticket to obtain Thank a certificate, you. but we okay. would certainly very much appreciate it because um, it does help us in improving our practice and also to create new webinars for you. So ladies, I know there are still questions in the Q&A too. <laughs> I just have to say thank you so much to those um, to Sarah and Karen for helping in the chat because <laughs> I know there's a lot of questions. So yeah, whatever we can help with right now is fine. Um, there was a question about the Seesaw webinar. Yes, we were a little tardy in getting the Seesaw webinar in our LMS and it is up. Um, it went up Thursday or Friday last week. So hopefully it will not be that late this, this coming week. But yes, everything is up. To obtain the certificate, you go to nea.org slash webinars, and there is directions there. And it will take you step by step in a pictorial fashion of how to obtain a certificate. Because there are so many people, we try, we're try. we really relying on automatically generating those certificates because we can't handle creating that many by hand. Um, so just trying to be the most efficient and this has worked thus far. Someone asked for our email to come up again. So I put that back up. All right. So, um, if Jennifer Kirby is still here. So Jennifer had a question, um, in the Q and a about if you were to use a Google survey to collect answers, is there a way to get the responses directly into the Google classroom submission rather than in the survey results or a spreadsheet? So I tend to use, yeah, so Google forms, you could do Google forms, um, and that would help with that. Um, 
Do you have any other suggestions, Karma, for that? Well, I know that if you collect things in a Google form, it will put it into a Google Sheets. Mm -hmm. um, there are probably tools where you can um, do more with that data, but I, I'm not as skilled with that area. I just, I usually just put it in a Google Sheet and have it access it that way. Yeah, I'm thinking like if you were doing more, like if it's an actual survey, um, is it an actual survey? Or are you thinking more of like questions? Um, so like, would it be like, could it be like short answer questions? Cause when it's short answer, like for me, I always just put um, like the options in the response. Um, and that helps. So when it's automatically grading it, it provides the feedback right then and there. If that helps. Yeah, so um, I've done that before where like if I'm doing, um, like if it's a check-in about, I don't know, we'll say a math problem where it's like, we'll just say it's like two plus three and I know the answer is gonna be five. I have them do a short answer response and then they have to fill in a five. And I'll usually do it as like, the numeral or I'll do it as like spelling out the word just so that in case they do it either or it will add it as correct. Oh, they're pretty individualized. Oh, that's rough. Okay, so that that could be a little bit more tricky. Yeah. Olivia, we're so happy we could help you. <laughs> All right. Carmen, Heather. I know Jennifer Kirby. That's why I asked if she went to WVU. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, because I thought I saw her name earlier. No, okay, because I knew Jennifer Kirby and she's a band director. And I was like, what? Sorry. <laughs> so I have to hop on another call, but it okay. was thank you so much for your expertise and for joining us, Sissy. That was fabulous. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Well, Anne, Anne and the team put it all together. So I'll pop <laughs> Thanks, Anna. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, love it. Thank you ladies so much. We really appreciate it. You're yeah, welcome. It's been fun. And thank you so much to our helpers. I appreciate it so much. And the helpers come out to show their faces. <laughs> <Yeah>. Thank you. <laughs> Always happy to help. Mm -hmm. All right. All right.